Hi everybody and welcome back to IGD DWF channel. In the previous episode I have explored a few different options to drive a TV or monitor flyback transformer and finally settled to use a single ended resonant drive that required some modification to be made on the original transformer. I want to just add a few remarks about the oscillator circuit. I have used the same wire sides for the base winding on the collector one just because I had already added those two 4 plus 4 turns windings for the push-pull oscillator and in that case they must both carry the drag current. In a single end oscillator with a base winding this one can be made with thinner wire like for example half millimeter diameter or even less. Of course, the correct phasing must be respected or there will not be the correct positive feedback needed for the oscillator. This is represented by the dots in the schematics. In other words, if the supply voltage is connected to the start of the collector winding, then the start of the base winding must go to the transistor's base and of course both windings must be wound in the same direction. If you want to replicate a similar circuit, start with a turn ratio collector to base that will be as close as possible to your B plus divided by 10. So since my B plus is 12 volts, I ended with the same turns on the collector and base windings, so the turn ratio is 1. The other components you must change for a different B plus value are R1 and R2 that give the starting polarization to the transistor's base. I have used a high voltage transistor in this circuit. The BU406 is rated at 200 volts collected to emit a voltage, but it is only seeing 20 volts in this circuit. You can use any transistor that has at least twice the voltage rating of the actual collector peak voltage that you measure in the actual circuit. So be sure to experiment with a high voltage transistor if you don't already know this value. Also, be aware that the actual oscillation frequency will depend on the internal capacitance of the transistor that you use. The previous video is linked in the description down below. In this video instead I will cover all the circuits needed to make a complete and reliable supply suitable for using my 11 inches CRT as a vector XY monitor. A black and white CRT needs a few different voltages. First we need the anode supply. In this case we needed a minimum value of 7.5 kV and the previous episode this call has been reached. Now we want also to be able to set precisely this value and have it regulated with some kind of feedback to avoid any change in the deflection sides with changing beam current. Then we must also generate some other voltages needed for the other CRT electrodes. This voltage at 200 volts to 350 volts for grid number 2, which is also known as the screen grid, a voltage for grid number 4, which is the focusing grid, and according to the data sheet, this could be any voltage between minus 50 volts to plus 500 volts. In practice, the focusing range for small CRTs is often so large that in some cases grid number 4 is simply grounded with no possibility to be tuned. However, in almost all design I've seen, the focusing voltage is obtained with a resistive divider on the screen voltage, so this is my plan too. Then we need either a rather low negative voltage for grid number 1 or a positive voltage for cathode drive or even better if possible both the positive and negative voltages to have easier control of the image brightness. According to the datasheet the voltage difference between the grid number 1 and the cathode for beam completely cut off is between 32 volts to 58 volts. Any voltage less than the cutoff will produce a visible trace on the screen phosphors. The first step for completing the power supply is to understand how many secondary windings we have on our transformer and what AC voltage we have on each of them. Do not forget that if a new primary winding had to be added, then also the original primary can now be used as a secondary winding. 
To find the windings we can simply check with the multimeter and record the continuity we find between the pins. On my transformer I found the windings I show in the picture. Since I had reverse engineered quite a bit of the TV schematic, I also know what the windings were for in the original circuit. So now I can use the old primary and the old G2 and G4 winding for my secondary supplies. Notice that the old primary and the grid secondary have one end in common. Then there is a low voltage secondary that was used by the horizontal controller integrated circuit to sense the end of flyback. So probably I won't use this low voltage secondary. Now let's measure the AC voltage on these secondary windings. I can use a few of my multimeters for this job because they can cope well with sinusoidal AC waveform even at the almost 30 kHz frequency of this resonant transformer. If I had used a PWM drive I would better look at the waveforms with the oscilloscope. Also because in that case I would also need to find the correct winding polarity to make the rectifiers conduct only during the flyback period. I have measured first the old primary and found about 65 volt AC, then the series of the primary and the grid 2, grid 4 secondary. So by subtracting the two values I can calculate the voltage on the grid secondary long, or I could even have measured it directly of course. Here is how I have obtained the needed DC voltages from the secondaries. I decided to ground the common point between the two windings. In this way I won't use the full 336 6 volts AC, but only 270 volt AC. That gave about 340 volts DC after rectification and filtering. I figured it out it was close enough to the 350 volts indicated on the datasheet, but indeed it would have been better to use the series of the two secondaries to have more voltage range for the focus grid, should it even be necessary. Anyway, I can do this modification in the future if really needed. That will only require swapping pin 4 and 5. Then, with the 65 volts AC winding, I obtained both a positive and a negative DC rail of about 80 voltage. Again, I can rectify both polarities because the primary drive is sinusoidal and not PWM based flyback. So the screen grid is fed with a trimmer and its voltage can change from 0 volts to plus 1340. The focus grid can instead go about 50 volts negative and again up to 340 volts positive. Grid number 1 is fed via the brightness potentiometer and can go from about minus 40 volts to 0 volts. And last but not least, a plus 80 volt rail will be used both for cathode drive and as the feedback DC voltage to regulate all the DC rails, including the anode supply. Now, the last part of this power supply is the regulator circuit that senses a secondary rail and tries to keep it constant by lowering the input voltage to the oscillator. This is the 1982 electro home monitor circuit again. It uses the plus 90 volts rail from a rectified secondary winding as the feedback voltage. I decided I can't use a similar approach because here the combination of Q901 and Q900 working both as meter followers will give a maximum output voltage that is no more than the input voltage minus 1.4 volts and with my 12 volts maximum input this will limit my maximum output to a much lower value so I need some sort of low dropout regulator circuit instead luckily the old 11 inches TV set had a low dropout regulator circuit exactly because it was intended also for battery operations so it would need to work with an almost discharged battery without dropping too much voltage in the regulator itself. Unfortunately, this circuit is regulating negative return, since in a self-contained TV circuit this isn't an issue. And it was also a good thing to do, because a low dropout negative regulator uses a high-powered NPN transistor that usually has better current and voltage saturation characteristics than a similar PNP transistor. In this case, this is 
is the PD142-6 in the schematic. However, it's easy to make a mirror circuit by changing the PNP to NPN and vice versa and swapping the positive and negative rates. So I quickly simulated a swapped circuit on LTSpice to confirm it would work as expected. Then the last step was to change the feedback voltage to use the secondary plus 80 volt rail that I have in my circuit. In this case I borrowed the idea from the electron schematic of dropping a good amount of DC voltage by using a Zener diode. Also I started giving a more final aspect to the power supply using an old floppy drive aluminum frame as part of the case and building the circuit parts on an etched PCB board where I glued small insulated islands of PCB material to solder the components. I've made holes to externally mount the trimmers for screen, focus and the main voltage controls. The power supply will be enclosed in a grounded metallic box to help suppressing much of the electromagnetic fields produced. During the various building steps, I've paused often to check the actual measured values were indeed matching what I expected. Here, for example, I'm checking the 340 volts DC rail. Since this regulator circuit doesn't have any form of current limiting, I have just added a fuse at the input after measuring the total current consumption of the supply when idle. I found about 450 milliamperes, so I opted for 800 milliampere fuse. However, the supply also survived a 10 kV short circuit when the high voltage probe tip got too close to the CRT frame. In that case, the fuse didn't blow, but I suspect that's because the primary oscillation suddenly then it stopped, as the short altered too much the primary impedance. I then wired a CRT neck board to the supply outputs. I found a good neck PCB from a recycled deck serial terminal. And I didn't use the original TV neck PCB because it hasn't all the protection parts like serious resistors and the spark gaps on all electrodes. The last CRT electrode to be powered is the heater filament. Since this CRT requires a nominal voltage of 11 volts, I have simply connected it to the 12 volt supply after the fuse and added a 15 ohms resistor to lower a bit the voltage. It's time now to demonstrate that the regulation circuit really works as intended. Here is the circuit in action. There is now only the high voltage anode connection. By turning the small trimmer we can change the output voltage with the component values I have used. It goes to about 8.3 kV minimum and about to 9.2 kV maximum due to the voltage loss through the fuse and the loss on the regulator itself. Once set to a given voltage, the negative feedback will try to maintain the output stable within about plus or minus 50 volts. So, at this point, can we finally try to display something on the CRT? Well, yes, we can. First, for XY drive, I had to remove the original deflection yoke and substitute it with a different one where the vertical coils have been rewound. Why this is needed on older winding procedures will be the argument of the next video, together with the deflection circuit details. By the way, this new yoke was donated by the same discarded serial terminal that already donated the CRT neck PCB. To drive the deflection yoke, I use the HP8116A function generator that in theory have enough voltage output for full deflection. And for the other axis, I use a small audio generator that is only capable of a few volts peak to peak. The deflection driver circuit I'm using was designed by Jürgen Müller. You'll find the link to his website in the description. Since there's no cathode drive circuit yet, the cathode is simply grounded and the brightness potentiometer is turned just enough to give a visible trace and not any brighter to avoid phosphor damage if the deflection fades suddenly, as there is no spot killer circuit yet to save the CRT. 
Here's a quick test where I'm playing with different frequencies and different waveforms on the function generator. However, I couldn't obtain full deflection even on the smaller vertical axis, so there's still quite some troubleshooting to be made in the deflection circuit or in the deflection assembly or in both of them. This will be covered in the next episode. For the moment, that is all. I hope you found this video interesting and if you have any question, please write in the comment section. See you next time and thanks for watching.